Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today we will study Ephesians chapter 3. If you missed any of our studies, you can always go to our website, kuim.org, or you can go to our SoundCloud or YouTube channel, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Before we continue, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for another opportunity for your children to gather tonight to study your word. Father God, I ask you that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will teach us, you will open the eyes of our understanding, that you give us revelation knowledge. Dear Spirit of God, you are the greatest teacher. I pray that you will minister to each and every one listening simultaneously that you will give to us what you want us to receive from today's teaching. That you will help us not only to be hearers, but doers of the word of God, because we propose to do that. Dear Father God, thank you because by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, we can now come boldly Unto the throne of grace. Through Jesus Christ, we have now access and boldness with confidence by faith in your presence. I thank you because you can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can think, above all we can ask, by that power that is working in us. Give us the acknowledgement of these truths. I take no glory for everything that you have done, Father God. The things that you are doing right now in our midst and the things that you will do in the future. In all of this, we say glory, honor to your holy name forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Good friends of mine, welcome again. Today we will study Ephesians chapter 3. We've already covered uh, chapters 1 and 2. And uh, if you miss any of this, uh, go to our YouTube channel or our website. They're all posted there. But let me give you a, a summary. The book of Ephesians uh, was written by Paul from prison along with... Um, Philemon, Colossians, and Philippians. So he wrote this uh, letter encouraging Christians who were at Ephesus at the time he was writing to be aware of the unsearchable riches that we have in Christ Jesus. He is writing to us the same letter today. Not only that we should be aware of these unsearchable riches, which are things like we were chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth, that we are now accepted in the beloved, that we have inheritance of God through Christ Jesus, and the power that we raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwell right now in us. And today we're going to unfold another one, which is we have boldness and access with confidence by faith through Christ Jesus. And not only that we, so we're supposed to come to the acknowledging of these things, of these uh, 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 searchable riches, that we should be partakers as well. And this is the, uh, uh, what we covered so far. Last week, we covered that the partition wall that separated the Jews from the Gentiles, that wall has been broken through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, we don't have any more racial or social distinctions. Right now, we are all one in Christ Jesus. 
That's what we covered last week. But we're going to go ahead now and continue with today's teaching. And Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, I read to you. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Here, Paul calls himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus, even though he was in prison at Rome. He should be calling himself a prisoner of Rome. But he does not see it that way. He sees it as Jesus Christ is in charge of Rome. That's the way he looks at it. There is someone who is greater than Emperor Nero, who was uh, the emperor of Rome at that time. So he sees himself that this problem is nothing because there is one who is greater than all these problems and that one is uh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the way that we have to act because of the faith we have in Jesus. You see, every time or any time we talk about our problems, we magnify them. We make them bigger. The goal is for us to talk to Jesus Christ about our problems and not to talk about the problems without Jesus. Because he is in charge. He is the one who is over every situation. You know, Jesus Christ demonstrated this when he was brought to Pilate, Pontius Pilate. And uh, he asked him questions, but Jesus Christ did not answer him. So he said to Jesus, why are you not answering me? Don't you know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? So Jesus Christ responded and said, you will have no power at all against me except it is given to you from above. So Jesus Christ himself knows that this problem uh, uh, of being in the presence of Pontius Pilate is, is, is not anything greater than God. As a matter of fact, he was right there because it is the will of God that he had to be in there, in, in the presence of Pontius Pilate. So the thing we learn from this is in our trials, in our tribulations, the things that come against us from the outside world, we should recognize that uh, we are not prisoners to these situations, but we are in Christ Jesus. And because we are in Christ Jesus, these situations uh, will be taken care of. In verse 2, it says, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gifts of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Paul talks about the revelation that was given to him, not only to him, but also to the apostles, the New Testament apostles and prophets. And uh, uh, like this revelation, you will find out that it was also given to Peter. When Peter was at Joppa at the house of Simon the Tanner, he had a trance and saw a vision 
in that vision, it, it tells him, it, if, if, you, if you draw a conclusion from the vision, it tells him that the time to end social racial distinction between the Jews and the great and the Gentiles are over. That time is over. He went ahead to explain what this uh, mystery that was revealed to him. He explained the mystery. The mystery, he talked about this uh, uh, in chapter 2. We covered it last week. That now the Jews and the Gentiles are the same before God through Christ Jesus. That the separation which the, uh, uh, the Jews observed against the Gentiles was over. Jesus Christ showed us this revelation when he was when he, during his ministry on earth. Even though the people did not understand it. Remember when he said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I must bring. And they shall hear my voice. And that shall be one fold and one shepherd. So Jesus Christ already talked about this. The breaking down of the partition and the bringing together into oneness of the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul, writing to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 28, says, Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave or free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So this is the mystery. Now, that word mystery there, the Greek word is uh, mysterion. Not like the way we define mystery in our modern English. For in our modern English, mystery means something that is not known, a secret. Nobody knows. But in this, it means something that was hidden from the Old Testament sense, but now is revealed to the New Testament sense. That's what it means. You see, the Old Testament prophets they saw mountain, mountain peaks. They did not see the valleys. They only, see the, they only saw the peaks. When you look at a, a mountain from a far distance, most often you will see only peaks. You don't see the valleys. Except you get too close, then you can see there are valleys between these peaks. So this is what the Old Testament sent, Old Testament prophets saw. Now they saw that a Messiah will be born, and this Messiah will sit upon the throne of David. And he will be there forever and ever. And we, we, we see this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And upon the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with, just, with judgment and justice. From henceforth, even forever, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform it. The saw that the Messiah will be born, the Messiah will come, then he's going to sit upon the throne of uh, David forever and ever to establish it with uh, judgment and with justice. But they did not see the dispensation of the church. They did not see the church age. Again, they saw 
Oh, the Messiah will suffer. Isaiah tells us that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon us, and with his tribes you were healed. They say, oh, Messiah is going to suffer. And in Psalm 22, which is a graphic depiction of crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Jesus cries out in verse 1, My Lord, my God, where has thou forsaken me? They saw this. All we have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own ways. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of all. So, through prophecy, they saw that he's going to suffer. But they were confused. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, and it says, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. So now they see the saw that Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Which means he's not going to inherit, he's not going to sit upon the throne. So they were so much confused. It was not revealed to them. And you know what he's talking about here in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9. You remember when Daniel, uh, when he was in Babylon, he, he, he saw by prophecy of for Jeremiah that 70 years has already been accomplished. And this is how long they were supposed to stay in Babylon. So he started to pray to God. He was interceding, confessing his sins and the sins of Israel to God, asking God for mercy. While he was doing this, angel Gabriel showed up to give him explanations. So he told Daniel, he says, 70 weeks, and these are 70 weeks of years. He says, Ad it appeared, Ad it amend upon Israel. So, which means 490 years altogether is determined upon Israel from the time they have to put an end to transgression. From the time they have to finish their transgression, put an end to sin, until the anointing of the Most High. He says it shall be 490 years. Angel Gabriel went one step further to explain to him. He says, but from the time the edict was given by Archazoros Longimanus in 445 BC to go and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming Messiah shall be 69 weeks of years, which is 483 years. Now, one year, 70 years is, is we, we have 70 years now missing. Where did the 70 years, where did it go? They did not understand all these things. He says, the Messiah will be cut off after the 483 years. Which if you calculate it from the time Edith was given, Till when Jesus Christ showed himself in the triumphant entry into Jerusalem from Mount Olives, was 483 years. What well, they did not understand that after the 483 years, the time clock of Israel was paused. It was put on a pause, it stopped. That was when the dispensation of the church came in. That was when the church age began. So the prophets, it was hidden from them. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter tells us that the prophets, they wanted to know more. They wanted to find out what time and circumstances that will surround the suffering of Christ and the glory that will follow. But they were told that the prophecy was not for them. It was for the future. So this is what he's saying here. So he tells us that um, 
This revelation that was given to him and the New Testament prophets and apostles were hidden from the Old Testament prophets. So that's, if you, that's, 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 that's what he's saying here. And now we get to verse 8. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here Paul humbles himself. He calls himself less than the least of all the saints. Because he acknowledges that it is by the grace of God that he was called into the ministry. That it was not by his own merits. Now Paul could have written to the Ephesians telling them, giving them his resume. He could have said, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. A Pharisee. I studied under Gamaliel. He could have told them that pertaining the righteousness which come which comes from uh, 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 from the law, that he was blameless. But he did not do this. Rather, he humbled himself and he called himself less than the least of all the saints. And this is how we're supposed to see ourselves when we do services for the kingdom of God. We shouldn't see ourselves like, uh, oh, God is very lucky to have someone like me with all my uh, 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 qualifications, with all my certificates, with all my degrees and my pedigrees. We shouldn't see ourselves like that. Remember the Bible says that if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will exalt us. But he that exalts himself shall be abased. The Lord uses the foolish things of this world to confirm the wise for the simple reason that no flesh should glory in his presence. This should be our attitude before God. In all of Paul's past qualification, he says, For the things that were gained to me are counted loss, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. All things that were gained to him, he counted them but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the attitude of Paul. Jesus Christ told us in Luke chapter 17, verse 10. He says, Likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Humility. In, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ. Even though he was in the beginning with the Father from the, before the foundation of the earth, he saw it not as robbery being equal with God. But he emptied himself of all his reputation. Became just like one of us. Was obedient even unto death. And he says, God highly exalted him. That the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. So you see what comes with humility. When we humble ourselves before the presence of God, in our services to God, in the things we do for humanity, he says God is going to exalt us in due time. So 
So now, Paul's, Paul continues. He, he, he says not only that uh, he was called to reveal this uh, mystery to the Gentiles. The mystery of the broken partition between the Jews and the Gentiles. Not only that he was called to reveal these secrets, but also to reveal to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches that are in Christ Jesus. And those unsearchable riches, we've been talking about them since we started the book of Ephesians. So many things. And he says, even the angels did not understand these unsearchable riches. They did not understand these things, this, uh, this uh, mystery that was hidden. For they inquired, they desired to look into salvation. For them, they were like, how is it possible that God would restore man after they have fallen from glory? After what they did? And they were baffled, they were surprised, and all of a sudden, they begin to think and, 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 and they see that now Christ dwells in men and, and women. So they are also surprised. Not only has he forgiven them and brought salvation to them, now he dwells in them. And it did not end there. For they said, what is man that thou art mindful of him, son of man that you visit him? So the angels, they even inquired to know about this mystery. It was not only hidden from the Old Testament prophets, but also from the angels. And through the church, through the revelation given to Paul and the apostles of the New Testament, now the angels are learning to these secrets. <laughs> is it not amazing? Remember the Bible says that we are the one to join the angels. So they, 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 they keep trying to find out what is going on. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> now we are in verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he unveils to us another unsearchable riches in Christ Jesus. This one now is big. This one now is a big one. He says in Christ Jesus, we have boldness. We have access with confidence by faith. So now we can come boldly in the presence of God Almighty. In the name of Jesus Christ. Without any fear or any guilt, we can come boldly. We don't have to go through pastors. We don't have to go through prophets. We don't have to go through people. Or to some people who pray through saints. We don't have to go through Virgin Mary. No, we don't have to. He says, because of what Jesus Christ did, now we have direct access to the presence of God Almighty. The Bible tells us, it says, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that you may obtain mercy and find grace for help in the times of need. Come boldly, without any more fear. Jesus says, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. In his name, we have now boldness. In the name of Jesus, we have now access to the Father. So, what do you do when you make your petitions to God? What do you do when you worship God? Are you trying to contact God through human beings? Or are you coming boldly as a child of God? Remember, God does not have grandchildren. We are all equal in the sight of God. No male, no female. No pastor, 
no, 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 no member of the church. In the sight of God, everybody is equal. We come together, we come as one. We are equal in his own sight. Remember in the Old Testament, the presence of God was shut up in the Shekinah glory of God was shut up in the Ark of the Covenant. It was in the Holy of Holies. The only one that has access to the presence of God was the high priest. And he had it once a year on Yom Kippur. And he goes in there after he had made so many sacrifices. If he made a mistake, according to Josephus, the historian, he says, when the high priest goes in there, they would tie a kind of rope on his waist. And then they have some bells that are attached on his garment. So whenever he makes a move in there, they can hear those bells ring. But when those bells stop ringing, oh, they know something wrong happened. So they're going to pull him out by the rope, which was tied on his waist. So it was only the high priest who had the access to the presence of God. But blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus made only one sacrifice. And after he went into the Holy of Holies with his own precious blood, the, the, the veil, the temple veil rented in two from the top to the bottom. And now men and women are ushered into the presence of God Almighty without any limitation. So that's what he's telling us here now. He says, in Christ Jesus, we have now boldness and access in the presence of God. There is no more limitation. We can now come with boldness, no more fear. There is no more guilt because of what Jesus Christ did. Now, remember what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you're going in there in your own ability or natural righteousness or your self-righteousness. No, we go in there in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, he sees Jesus because we are in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, my friends, my question to you is, if you have been trying to have access to God through people, through prophets, through saints, what are you going to do now? Now that you have the knowledge because with knowledge comes responsibility what are you going to do is he going to change the way that you approach god because god is our father he loves every one of us he sees us the same let me give you this illustration it will probably will help you understand what i'm saying let's assume that you have children you're married and you have children and every time your one of your children wants something from you, they will have to go through your friend. So they will call a friend, your friend, and say, please, can you tell daddy, please, to get me a bicycle? Please, 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 call daddy. Tell daddy to buy me a bicycle. And then your friend have to call you to make a request on behalf of your own child. How does that sound to you? It doesn't sound right. It doesn't see, I don't see any connection there. I don't see any relationship, father and child relationship in this story that I just told you. But this is how some of us behave in the presence of God. We don't see him as our own father. We don't see him as one family. Now we want to go through other means just to have access to the he our own heavenly father. Are you getting what I'm saying? I want you to make that decision to always go boldly to the presence of the almighty God in the name of Jesus Christ. Anytime you want to worship the Father, anytime you have a petition for the Father, go boldly. He loves every one of his children the same. And the Bible tells us now that we have that access and boldness because of what Jesus Christ did. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 13, it says, Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. Paul tells them, don't worry about my tribulations, my persecutions, the thing that I have suffered. It is for your own good. The revelation that I brought to you cost me much. For the Jews persecuted him. About seven times he was in prison. He had shipwrecks. He was beaten with rods. He suffered hunger and thirst. So many things. Writing to the Philippian church, he tells them that the things that happened to me was for the furtherance of the gospel. These things that happened to me, he says, it wasn't just for nothing. Something good came out of it. A lot of good things came out of this. He tells them to, don't worry about the persecution. The good thing is that you are receiving the message. You are getting this revelation. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. In verse. Now in verse 14, he says, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Paul talks about bow, bowing down his knees. And that uh, reminds me about uh, what is the appropriate posture when we pray. What is the correct posture when we pray? Because this, to so many people, is very confusing. They don't know the right position when they pray. Is he standing up? Is he sitting down? Is he prostrating? Is he bowing? What is the right posture when we pray? Now, the posture when we pray means nothing to God. What is very important to God is the condition of our heart. What kind of heart do we have when we pray, when we approach God? That's what matters the most. Whether we are standing up or we are kneeling down, it doesn't matter. You can pray when you are driving your car. You can take a work and then you are praying while you are walking. At your job, during the lunchtime or break time, you can sit down in the chair and you pray and you, speak, and, and you communicate with God. The Bible doesn't give us any absolute commandment on the posture when we pray. Now, Paul says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Paul tells us this. But if we search the scriptures, Jesus Christ knelt down at the garden of Gethsemane. Daniel bowed facing Jerusalem three times a day when he prayed. When Abraham was interceding for uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he stood up in the presence of God when he was making his intercession. Jehoshaphat, when he was being attacked by those three kings, he bowed down. So the position doesn't matter. What matters the most is what is the condition of your heart? For God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Remember when uh, 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 God looks at the, at the heart. When he sent Samuel to go and anoint one of the sons of Jesse so that he can replace uh, 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 Saul. Because he rejected Saul at this point. When Samuel went in there to anoint one of the sons of Jesse. Now the first one came out, Eliab. Tall and handsome, big guy. And Samuel said, surely this is the anointing of the Lord. 
And God, and, and God told Samuel, he says, I have rejected him. For man looks on the outward appearance. But he says, I look, I, I look at, at, at the heart. I see the heart. That's where I look at. I don't look at your position when you pray. Jesus Christ cautioned us. Says when you do your righteous deed in, in the presence of men. He says, be careful how you do your righteous deeds in the presence of men. Don't be like the Pharisees. They would like to pray in open places. They will plan themselves to, so that when the time of prayer comes, they are in a place that will be like in a public place. So then everybody will look at them and say, oh, look at how righteous this one is. Oh, look at how righteous he is. But he says, when you pray, go into your closet for your heavenly father who sees in the secret. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to reward you in the open. So if you have been troubled all this while on asking yourself this question, what is the best position to pray? Think about it. God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the place where you are praying. No, there are some of us who would like to pray in a particular place, like inside the church. Or some who would like to kneel in front of a statue or an altar thinking that the presence of God is in that place. But hear me, friends. God is not in buildings. God is not in statues. God is not in altars. But where is God? Our body, we are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. He dwells in us now. So when we go to the church, we bring God with us. God cannot be confined in a building or in a statue or in an image. It's an insult to God. When you pray kneeling before images and statues, what does that tell you? It tells you that you have fallen from the awareness of the presence of God. It is a spiritual problem. It tells you that you need something now to remind you about the presence of God. You are no longer conscious about his presence. Now you need an image, something to remind you about God. And against the commandment of God. He says you will not make any image of being in heaven on earth or in the sea. Neither will you bow before them to pray before them. That's what God commanded. But what are people doing now? The thing that God can be found in images, in altars, or inside the church. So this is where they have built their faith. But the Bible says, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Christ is in you now, the hope of glory. Greater is he, greater is he that is in you, than he that is in the world. Which means, there's one who dwells in you now. And wherever you go, he goes. You don't have to go find him somewhere. He goes with you. So once you have this consciousness and this awareness that God resides now in you, he has come to take a abode in you. The day you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit moves in you. Which means through the Spirit of God, God lives in you now. And once you remember that, you know that you can pray anywhere. Standing up, running, walking, wherever you are, whatever position, you can lift up your hands and say, Father Adonai, blessed be your holy name. Thank you for the opportunity to be accepted in the beloved. Thank you because right now I have an inheritance in you through Christ Jesus for choosing me before the foundation of the earth. Thank you because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in me. Thank you for I have now boldness and access with confidence by faith in your presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Ghost. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Remember Paul begins to pray spiritual prayer for these people, for the, for the efficient saints. 
He did not pray to them for them about uh, acquiring limousines and mansions and uh, etc. No, he didn't pray such prayers. Even though they're supposed to have, be comfortable, but he prays for the most important thing. And that's the spiritual prayer. So, first of all, he says that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Or did I miss something? Okay, I missed one verse. So, we're going to go back to um, verse 16. I think that's where we pick it up from. That he will grant you. Verse 16, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with mind through his spirit in the inner man. This is the prayer he prays for them. That within their spirit, that the Holy Spirit of God will strengthen their inner man. The inner man is the real you, is your spirit. Man is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in the body. So he's praying for the spirit of a man now. He said that the spirit, your spirit, will be strengthened by the power of the Holy Ghost. Remember the day you got born again? The Holy Spirit moved in you. And because he is now in you, the Holy Spirit is supposed to be the one that you're supposed to yield to. So Paul prays now that they will be able to yield to the Spirit of God, which will help them live a successful life. Your old nature is still there, warring against your new nature. Those things, they don't agree. So now, it depends on the one that you yield to. If you yield to the old nature, then yeah, that will be living by flesh. Do you believe in according to the dictates of the flesh? But if you, through the Spirit of God, do modify the deeds of the flesh, you will live that successful life, that life that is expected of you as a born again child of God. So he prays for them here that they will be strengthened by the power of the Holy Ghost so that they can be able to live this life. Remember, without the power of the Holy Ghost, you cannot be able to live this kind of life. It is the Spirit of God in you that will empower you to be able to live this kind of life. But you got to yield to the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God to be able to achieve this life. So he tells you here, he prays for them that they will be strengthened by the power of the Holy Ghost. So they will be successful Christians. He prays again for them that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. What does that mean? I thought they are already born again Christians. And the Bible tells us that by one spirit are we baptized into the same body. Which means the Holy Spirit of God dwells in them. Through Christ, the Holy Spirit of God dwells, Christ dwells in them through, through the Holy Spirit. So why is he saying that Christ may dwell in their hearts? He's already there. So what is it? What, what is he talking about here? He's talking about here, that word, that word dwell here, that word dwell here means that Christ will inhabit, that Christ will be comfortable, that Christ will settle in your heart through the way you live your mannerisms so that you don't do the things that grieve the Holy Spirit if you have a visitor in your house I mean there are places where you visited in the past and you were not comfortable staying in that place Every day, you are counting by the hour, by the minutes. 
you know you want you you just want to leave that place you just want to get out of that place because that place was not comfortable it was not conducive for you and there are places that you visited and you wanted to stay even longer because it was a comfortable place an enjoyable place a welcoming place so this is what he's trying to tell you here there is a kind of lifestyle that you gotta live that will make jesus christ want to settle in your heart by the holy ghost so that you don't grieve the spirit of god now what kind of pictures do you have on the wall of your heart is a question i gotta ask you what kind of pictures do we have on the walls of our heart is it the kind of picture that jesus christ will sit down by the holy ghost and say nice picture is it a picture of love is it a picture of peace is it a picture of joy is it a picture of sound mind is it the picture of advancing the kingdom of God? Is it the picture of desiring the things of God? What kind of pictures do you have on the wall of your heart? Or is it a picture of uh, malice? Contention? Is it a, a picture of hatred? Is it a picture of envy? Is it a picture of uh, all kind of things that will displace God? That is what he's saying here. That Christ will dwell in your heart. That he will dwell there. That he will settle there. That he will be very comfortable in your heart. By the Holy Ghost. David, in Psalm 139, he says, Search me, Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me... In the way everlasting. David wasn't sure the condition of his heart. The heart is very deceitful above all. And desperately wicked who can know it. He wasn't sure of the condition of his heart. He wanted to make sure that he, he's not deceived. He's not deceiving his heart. So he says God. You know my thoughts even before I think them. I want you to search in there. If there is something that I'm covering out of ignorance, something that I'm doing to displease you without knowing it, something that has not been brought to my awareness because my heart can deceive me. I can deceive my heart. He says, show me. I want you to bring those things out to my understanding. Reveal them to me by your spirit so that I will be able to walk in the path everlasting. So this is the question we got to ask. This is a prayer we got to pray to God. Help me, God. Search my heart. See if there be any wicked ways in me. Anything you find, point them out to me. I want to change them. I want to do those things that will please you. I want to live that way. Oh, that will lead me to that everlasting. Show me, Lord, I'm asking you. So this is what he's talking about here, that Christ will dwell in our heart. That you, being rooted, in, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the sense what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. So now he's talking about the love of God that we will be able. Remember, this is the prayer Paul is praying for them. So now he's talking about love here that we will be able to understand, rooted. We will have that uh, deep understanding of the love of God for us. We will understand that the love of God for us is unconditional and is everlasting. The moment we come to this awareness, it will help us now to stand bold. It will dissipate every fear. For perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment in it. 
the moment we understand how deep God loves us, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will make our faith even stronger. Knowing that God loves you regardless, unconditional, it will make you even perform those things which you were supposed to do. Not only that we understand that God loves us now, but it will help us to love other people. So now we can love other people. Not only those who love us, but unlovable. Jesus Christ says, by this shall men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So now he's talking about the ones that are your brethren. But he turns around again and he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So it's twofold. The love we have for our own brethren and then the love we have for the unlovables. And you know why? We have the ability now to love the unlovables. The Bible tells us that the love of Christ is shared abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is now in us. In Romans chapter 5 verse 5. So we have the ability now. All we got to do is to tap into what is already in there. For the fruit of the Spirit of God is love. So it is in there already. So if we know how much God loves us, it will cause us not only to love God, but also to love our brethren and those people that are unlovable. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 19, it says, And know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It says the love of God which passes knowledge. How can you know something that is not knowable? Someone would ask. <laughs> that is, that is, it looks like that's what he's saying here. But actually, that's not what he's talking about. The word here used here as know is a gnosko, which means an experiential knowledge. The Greek word is gnosko. It means experiential knowledge. Knowledge that is put into practice. A practical knowledge. And then the other word that it says passes knowledge here is gnosis, which means mental intelligence, being aware of something. So if we put it together, what he's saying here is he wants you to get to the level that not only that you have the mental awareness of the love of God, he wants you to experience it. Not only that you know that for God loved, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. Some people there can memorize that. They have mental knowledge of that. But God demonstrated his love towards us while we were yet seen as Christ died for us. Some people can memorize that so they have mental awareness of it. But he's saying here, instead of you having that mental awareness of it, he wants you to have the practical experience of it. He wants you to experience it. To come to that experience. To actually not be a hearer, but a doer. So there's a big difference from saying and doing from experiencing something and knowing it. So he tells us here, not only to know, but to take another step further, which is having a practical 
application of that which you know. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says here, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think. Are you hearing that, my friends? We are prone to limiting God. We limit God in our finances. We limit God in healing. Now, when somebody, or when we have a headache, it is easy for us to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive healing for my headache. Jesus took my infirmities. He bore my sicknesses. And by his stripes, I am healed. Amen. It is easy for us to receive when we have just a simple malady. But then the doctor reports, the doctor's report comes back and he says, cancer, stage four. And now every hope is dashed. We no longer think that God who healed a headache can also heal cancer. We forget that the one that created the whole body from the head to the toe, inside and outside, can also replace broken bodies and put brand new organs in them. So we limit God. In our finances, we are asking God, please, I need money to pay my rent this month. I need money. I need to pay my rent. Oh God, I need $200, $500, And we're limiting God. Forgetting that God can give you a house that is paid in full. What is a million dollars to God? He that gives you $200, can't he give you a million dollars? So we limit God. Israel limited the Holy One of Israel, the Bible tells us, to unbelief. And as a result of this, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They were hemmed in because they did not believe in God. They limited him. The same God that gave them water out of the rocks. That they were there, he fed them with manna. But they limited him. They thought he was not able to deliver them into the promised land which is given them. Think about how great God is. Think about how big the creator of the universe is. The one that says, behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh is anything too hard for me. The psalmist says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have created, what is man that you are mindful of him? Son of man that you visit him. Yet you have made him a little lower than angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. How big is God to you? Consider the universe. How big? The galaxies we have, billions of stars in one galaxy, billions of stars in one galaxy. And we are told that we have billions of galaxies. How many planets do you think we have in these galaxies? That is God who put them together. Who uphold the universe by the word of his power, put everything in place. And this universe has not self-destroyed itself because of the power of his word. Let's hear 
them that come to him believe that he is God. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Before you will come to God, understand that he is God, the maker of the heavens and the earth. The stars, the seas, the ocean, everything. And remember that he is a rewarder of those that will seek him by faith. Now, before you make your petition to God, this we, we're going to talk a little bit about prayer now. Because it's all included in this. This is the, our attitude when we pray. That's what he's talking about here. We should understand that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. So in our prayers, now I'm going to talk a little bit about prayers. Find out what the will of God is before you make your prayers, your petition to God. And I'm talking about prayer or petition now. We have different types of prayers. But I'm going to talk about prayer or petition. When you make your request to God, find out what is the will of God. Search the scriptures. Find out what are the promises you have backing up that request. For John tells us that if we pray according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we have confidence towards God. The purpose of prayer is for the will of God to be done. Not your own will. That kingdom come. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is not going to give you access to those things that are against his will. Even if you pray continuously. It doesn't matter. His will. If we, if, if we abide in him and his word abide in us. We can ask whatever we will and it shall be done to us. If we abide in him, if we abide in his word, and his word abides in us. So we got to find out first of all, what does the word of God say about this petition that I'm about to make now? Very important. And then you make your petition. With prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, the Bible says, let your petition be made known to God. So you praise him first. Acknowledge how great he is. Worship him first. And then make your petition. And then with thanksgiving in your heart, by faith, believe that you have received. And then you give him praise because if you believe that you receive something, you will be very happy. You will show, you will give thanks. Another thing that I want to talk to you about is being patient while you pray. When you pray, be patient. Remember that God sees everything. He's not limited by time. He sees the end from the beginning. Sometimes we come to God with our petition and we already planned out how it's going to be, how it's going to work out. So we give God the petition and we tell him how to do it with our limited understanding at that moment. But there are things that God will not give us for the simple reason that uh, it will destroy us. There are things that God will not give us because he, have, he has a better one for us. He has something more superior and better than what you are asking. There are times when you pray for something and then you don't see that you don't see it come true. And maybe a few months down the road or a year or two years down the road, you begin to thank God for not answering that prayer. Because if he had answered that prayer, it would have been to your disadvantage. That's why we must have patience. For all things work together for good to those who love God. Now, the good of God could not be your own good. Sometimes, if it's no, it's still an answer. And it's good for you. But at that moment, you think, Oh God, why didn't you answer my prayer? Why did you let that happen? And we begin to question God. 
The one that sees everything. The one that knows what is better for you. The one that sees the end from the beginning. So when we pray, we got to be patient. We say, God, I don't know how this is going to work out. But I am very confident that your own answer is good for me. So I let, I let you work it out your own way. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a good way to pray. Now, there are some of us we don't even ask. We don't even pray. We think that God knows, so we are children of God. So he knows what the problem, we, we, we don't have to ask him. But Jesus says, your father knows what you have need for before you ask him. And he says, ask and you will receive. That is the reason why the Bible tells us to ask. Even though God knows your need, he still, he still says, ask that you may receive, that the joy may be full. When you ask God, when you pray, you open the opportunity for God to do something for you that he had been longing to do for you. Because you are a free mortal agent. God will not violate that uh, choice that is given to you, that right that is given to you. So he wants you to invite him. He wants you to ask. That's what we do when we pray. So God now comes in and you will find out that it's something that he's been longing to do for you all this while. But he's been waiting for you to ask. So that's why we have to have communion with God, fellowship with him. And let any time we approach God, let it not be just a request, request, and request. If you have a son, the only time they show up to your uh, 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 room or they call you, or they have communication with you is, Dad, I want this. Dad, I want that. Dad, I want that. You don't have a very good communication with that child. You don't really like that behavior. But if you have a son that will show up, every now and then he says, Oh, Daddy, I just came to hang out. I just came to talk. I just came to fellowship. What's going on, Daddy? What can we do today for fun? That child is, you look at that child as a very special child. The same, this is the same thing we do to God. If we approach him all the time with request, 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 he sees no fellowship in it. But there should be time when we should approach God with just thanksgiving and praise. Oh, Father, how awesome it is to come in your presence. Just to fellowship, just to worship you. Just to behold your glory and your power. Just to look upon your beauty. Oh, Father, I am so happy that I am your son. I am so happy, oh, to be chosen in Christ Jesus. You, you just talk to him, fellowship with him. And he's there waiting for you to say, Daddy, I want this, I want this, I want this. But you don't ask. Because that's not the reason why you came. You came to just fellowship. You came to just to worship, to praise him. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This should be our attitude. So now, do not limit God. Remember he says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. Could mean sometimes when we ask for a dime, he gives us a dollar. <laughs> Are you hearing that? Don't limit God. Somebody's asking God, Oh, Father God, I need a job. I need a job so that I'll be able to pay my bills. Oh, oh, I am late on one of the payments. I, I, need, a, I need a job. Oh, Father God, help me. You are asking God for a job so that he can make a minimum payment? Whereas God can give you a job that pays you more than enough. So that you'll be able to help other people. You'll be able to advance the kingdom of God. You are asking God to give you money to rent a one-bedroom apartment. And you have three sons. Or you have three children. Whereas God can give you a house with more rooms in that house. 
paid in full so that you will have rooms for other people to come in. And when they come in, they can stay with you until they get their feet on the ground. Are you limiting God the way you are asking? You are asking God for a car. Oh God, give me any kind of a car. I don't care. As long as he can get me to a point A and to B. That's the kind of prayers people make. Any kind of car. Whereas God can give you a brand new car. A car that can help you now transport other people. Bring them to church and pick them up after that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we should know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. According to that power that is in us. The power of the Holy Ghost. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, I've come to the end of today's teaching. If you under the sound of my voice and you are not yet a Christian, you're not born again. To born again means that you have made the choice to let your self-righteousness go. Now you depend on Jesus Christ 100%. As your Lord and as your Savior, you believe that he is the son of God. He died for your sins. God raised him from the dead. And you ask him to come into your life today and be your Lord and your Savior. And then you begin a relationship with him. Very important. That's what it means to be born again. There are so many people in the church. Members of churches. Who are not born again. Because they're trying to get to God through their own works. Through their own attendances. Because of the donation they have given to the churches. And because of different committees in the church which they belong to. So now they think they get in because of these things. But it's not so. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way you can get into the kingdom of God except by Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. So, you got to make the decision which way to go. There is only one way. Now, there are so many religions in the world and they believe that all roads lead to God. They may lead to other gods, but not the God, the creator of heaven and the earth, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to him. There is only one way. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to heaven. It's not a broad way. So you don't come in anyhow. You got to come in only one way. And Jesus Christ says, I am that way. And he says, if you reject Jesus, you cannot have access to the Father. Except you only have, when you have Jesus, that's when you're going to have access to the Father. This decision is for you to make. No one is going to make the decision for you. And this decision can only be made when you are alive. If you die, it becomes too late. The day you hear his voice, Harden not your heart. Today is a day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You are the one supposed to make this decision. Jesus Christ, God created us as free mortal agents. So he's not going to force you. You're going to make the choice. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in. So you will be the one opening that door. Your parents is not going to open the door for you. The, the, your, your siblings, they are not going to open the door for you. About 155,000 people died today in the world. Now, where did they go? 
It depends on the decision they made when they are still alive. If they choose Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will go to heaven. But if they rejected him, they will spend eternity in hell. Hell is a real place, so I have to warn you about it. A place of torture. A place where there is no light. Darkness. Where there is no presence of God. This is hell. You don't want to go to that place. And it's an opportunity today for you to miss hell and make heaven your eternal home. The Bible tells us that he that believes is not condemned. But he that believes not is already condemned. Seeing that he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And he says this is the condemnation. That light came into the world. But men will not come to light. The only reason why people will spend eternity in hell is because they refuse to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. That's the only reason. Jesus says, if, if you believe that I'm not he, you're going to die in your sin. He that believes has life. But he that believes not shall not see life. And the wrath of God abides in him. Now think about this. So many people, they blame Adam and Eve for eating from that tree that God warned them not to eat from. So every day they say, Adam, 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 and they blame him. But today, the same opportunities presented before you. The tree of life and the tree of death. Which one are you going to choose? Are you going to receive Jesus Christ who is the life? Or are you going to reject him which is death? It is up to you to make that decision. So I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. Pray this prayer with all your heart and you will be right now born again. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son. He died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you this day to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I am now born again. My sins are washed away. And my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Friends, if you pray that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Now, you are a baby Christian. It is very, very important that you find a church where they teach the word of God. Become a member of that church so you can grow. You can grow in your faith. Remember that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Desire the sincere make of the word of God that you may grow thereby, Peter says. Buy a Bible. Put your nose in the word of God so that Satan don't take advantage of what just happened now. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world. Those that are praying for this ministry. Those that are engaging in their services and in their financial support for this ministry. If you would like to be a partner to this ministry, please go to our website. It is www.kuim.org. There will be a donation button there where you can securely give your donations to help us even reach more people for Christ Jesus. Remember, it is only those who hear the word of God and they put them in practice. They are the ones who receive the benefits of the word of God. <clears throat> Friends, I pray for you this day. May the Lord bless you and be with you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you divine health and give you victories in your life and give you prosperity and bless your week. In Jesus' name. Surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. O kobari salabanto. Enenebush gena anglandam skurubushku. Paria askatit. 
ne gon grodos ko posia ambati pati paria la kondo sholo ko brotoste ani yang grandans ko bonito